Welcome everyone to Art of Advisory. My name is Hector Garcia and I will be interviewing Deborah Angeletta with Angeletta and Associates. Uh, her business focuses on helping folks in the, in the profession uh, hone down their skills in sales and the sales process in order to capture more customers and better quality customers. So Deborah, welcome to the show. Hector, thanks so much for having, uh, having us together today. I'm so excited to be here. Me too, Deborah. I heard you in another podcast and I really, really loved uh, what you had to say about the sales process. So I wanted to bring you in and kind of pick your brain about how to help uh, folks like me. I'm an accounting professional. I do a little bit of IT work, a little bit of accounting work, and I'm, I'm making that transition into advisory services. And a lot of the folks that listen to our podcast are in sort of the same boat and they're making that transition into advisory services. So I would love to pick your brain about how do we have better sales conversations in order to achieve that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and a great point to make. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, a lot of people think of sales as something that they do to someone, meaning that, you know, we've got to convince somebody to do business with us or it just doesn't feel right. A lot of the words that people use, the big technical word is icky. It just feels icky, right? So it's about changing the mindset around that to say, you know what, you're not selling anything to anyone that they can't use or that they don't already need. It's about being in service and really flipping that switch in your mind to say, hey, instead of selling someone, why don't we put it in a different context? How about, you know, everybody that I hear, all oh, accounts, bookkeepers, financial coaching professionals, they always say their number one thing that they want to be doing is they just want to help more people. So if you can start picturing your sales conversation as a way to help someone or to be in service, it just changes everything about your conversations, but it also helps you stand out and land the business. So let me, uh, let me break down that a little bit. So your first uh, take into that is that you are calling it a sales conversation and you're using the word sales, but you're not afraid to use the word sales because you want to change the context around it. So instead of being this uh, traditional sort of pushy type of process, it is a more of a, a service driven process where being a salesperson is the same thing as being uh, somebody of service to your client. So can you break that down a little bit? Is there, is there maybe a different language or different words you use to help people to ease into just being comfortable by you know, being a salesperson at the same time that they're a service person? Yeah, I think it's a matter of just taking those traits that you naturally bring to the table and whatever it is your desire when it comes to your clients. When you are dealing with people, and I know Hector, you're talking with a lot of people and you've got a big audience that wants to up-level themselves in order to become more in that advisory role. And not everybody wants to do that, right? So it's a matter of, you know, how do you become that strategic advisor? How do you up-level yourself and then also up-level the conversation? And how you do that is just start to make that little shift in your mind and you want to know what I would even take that sales conversation title and take put it off the table we have a six-week class that we teach and we take people through and we actually take the sales part right off the table and call it a service conversation because I know people in your audience accountants bookkeepers coaching professionals they just want to be in service they just want to help people but they want to do it on a higher level so even just changing the words that that you use is very powerful so shifting that from a sales conversation to a service conversation really helps pe put people at ease. And is there a particular process that you would like to share with the audience? Is there a couple of steps that you take? Is there a, a you know, sort of a suggested way to get started? What, what would you, how would you um, create a framework around how to have that service slash sales conversation? Sure. It's a great question. You know, there's so many people that teach sales out there and you want to know what a lot of the systems that are out there, there's no right or wrong. It's just whatever works for you. What the whole that I found in the industry is that a lot of people don't understand why they're doing what they're doing, right? So if you ask a specific question, sometimes we come up to some resistance to that question because we don't understand why we're asking it. So we get really uncomfortable. So one of the things that we do a little differently is we insert how people behave and looking at people's behaviors of why you ask a question the way that you do. And there's some flexibility around that. So one of the first things that we always say is that, you know, when it comes to talking with a prospect, it's not about giving them this great pitch and telling them all the certifications you have and how great you are. 
really the number one tip, and this is the first thing I'm going to give you, is always make the conversation about your prospect, not about you, right? Take yourself out of the equation and just get really super curious. So one of the first questions that we always teach our students is, you know, ask a curiosity question. Hey, listen, I'm curious. Why are we talking here today? Why did you come to the call today? And then it just starts to open. Un it opens the floodgates for the individuals on the other end of the phone, your prospect to just go ahead and tell you what's going on because you're not coming at them with a pitch of, oh, you need to do this and this is how great we are, right? It's not about you. You switch it and make it about them. It just changes the whole conversation. So let, let's, let's, take, let's put that into sort of tangible terms. So we, we, get, a, we get a phone call uh, from a prospect that says, hey, I found you on the internet. I'm looking for a new accountant um, you know, that, that knows QuickBooks. You know, can you help me? And I think typically we go into pitch mode and say, yes, of course, we have 10 years of experience in QuickBooks and we help a lot of people and we charge this much. I mean, you're saying that that is the sort of like we're almost triggered to react that way. But um, but you're saying, you know, hold off on that. You're saying hold off on that and make the conversation about them. It's funny, you know, any any you know, corny movie about dating and, and stuff like that. The person that gives the, the tips to the other person says, remember, don't talk about you, talk about uh, the other person. I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of works. This is just basic human psychology, isn't it? It is, it is. And that's where, you know, we have to create. So coming at it from a psychological perspective, the first thing we have to do with people that don't know us is we have to create familiarity, meaning that we can't be new and we can't be dangerous to them, right? So we've got that fight or flight in our brains, right? For something we don't know, we're trying to figure, are you safe? And the way that you present yourself as safe is you ask that question and make it about them because when they're talking and sharing, then you can start speaking to some of the things that they're talking about, that creates the rapport very quickly. And that also elevates the no like trust factor. So you can go ahead and speed up that relationship a little bit to actually get to an engagement. Okay. So it has to start about them because when they talk about their issues, their problems, their business, they're obviously familiar with it because it's their own story. But is there a, is there a place in the conversation where we start talking about us? Because we do have to make the presentation. We do have to make the point that we're a good fit for them, right? Like not every prospect calls ready to give us a credit card number. They also want to be sold, right? Exactly. But this is where we have the art of the conversation, right? We want to go ahead and make sure that we are structuring our conversation with our prospects in a way that brings them naturally to working with us. And there is a way to do this. And there is a questioning process that you go through. But believe it or not, I know it's going to sound counter counterintuitive, but we don't get to pitch ourselves until the very end. The whole conversation is about the prospect. And there is, there are certain steps. Actually, we have a, um, for, for listeners, I'll tell you at the end, but we do have um, six crucial questions you can ask in any conversation to double your value. Okay. Are you going to tell us uh, at the end and how to, how to get the questions yes, or maybe you yes. want us? Okay. Yes. Um, can, can we do one of these? Can you tell us one yes. of those questions? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So one of the first things is, is obviously be curious because that opens up the floodgates for someone. So in your, in your example, Hector, someone calls up and says, Hey, I'm looking for a new accountant. That's a QuickBooks pro advisor. And then, so the next question could be, great. What, why are we talking <coughs> to you? What's going on with your accounting? Have you had an account before? What's been your experience? Why are we talking today? So it's about, you know, okay, why are they calling? And it's just a natural curiosity when it comes to ourselves to say, all right, instead of telling them, you know, what we do and how great we are for our clients, what is your situation? Why are you coming to this call today? Because you want to know what? Maybe a pretty unique situation. We can't always assume, right? You know how assuming gets us in trouble of what they want from us. So why don't we have them tell us what they actually want? So that right. first question is crucial. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Do the second question. That's, that's yeah. Great. So one of the second questions that we always teach everybody, and this is something that nobody thinks about, but once you've been through enough conversations, second question we always ask, okay, so um, are you the sole decision maker in your business or are there other decision makers? And we ask that very early on because if there's a partner in a business or if there's somebody else that needs to be involved in the conversation, how many times have you been on the phone with someone, you go through everything, you have a great rapport on the phone, you think you're gonna land the client, and at the end, what do they say? I gotta talk to my business partner, right? 
So we ask that very early in the conversation today. Hey, do we have all the decision makers on the phone to have this conversation today? And if not, why don't we get them on the phone or reschedule so we can all have a very robust conversation and understand what your needs are. And it may not just be a partner. Sometimes this is just an employee of the business that's probing or, or finding out prices or, or, or they're just compiling information so they can present it to their boss. I found it in a lot of cases that I've had people calling that were, uh, that were thinking that they needed a, a consultant, a QuickBooks consultant, whatever it happens to be, and uh, the decision maker wasn't even involved. They were going to come to them and say, hey, this is what we found, and then they may not even have a budget for it. So I think it's a just very important question to ask up front. So which is, what's the best way? Can you reiterate exactly how you would ask that? Yeah, so once they've given you the, the overview of why you're talking and say, okay, great. Now, are you the sole decision maker in your business? Are there any other partners? And then they'll tell you. It's just as simple as that. It's just very benign. You ask the question up front. Just you want to make sure that you have all the right people on the phone at that time. And if you don't, you're going to know where to drive the conversation from there because if you don't have the decision maker on the line, are you going to spend an hour with this person? No. Right. right. You're going to make sure they have the pertinent information they need to go on and then reschedule a time when all the decision makers can be on the call. Yeah. I like the way you're wording it. You're saying, are you sold the decision maker? Not, are you the decision maker? I actually like the way you word it because some folks may get you know, insulted if they're the one calling you and explaining to you that you are then challenging them on whether or not they make decisions on their business. So I think by, I mean, it's just as, as elegant as saying, are you the sole decision maker? and not are you the decision maker, it doesn't leave any assumptions that you are assuming that they're not the decision maker and some folks could take that into offense. So I actually love that, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, great. So, so Deborah, let's move on to um, uh, maybe some of the sort of more of the closing part of the conversation, right? So we, so we, we started by uh, making sure that we understood who the decision maker was. We asked uh, key questions about what, what they need in their business. We made it a lot about them. Um, you said we wait towards the end to, to present ourselves. Uh, what would be after we ask all these questions and we, we acquire all the possible data, what is the next uh, transition? Do we move to closing? Do we talk about yourselves? I mean, about ourselves. Do, do we talk about the solution? What, what's the next step after we ask all the um, inquiry questions? Sure. So one of the key things that you want to go ahead and distill all the safer information down to is what we call the anchor. The anchor of a conversation is their big, huge problem that they want you to solve. Now, here's why this is really important, because we as ourselves, as practitioners, now listen, I know all of your listeners, I probably couldn't even, you don't even have to question it. They're all really good at what they do. Accountants, bookkeepers, coaching professionals, they are awesome at what they do and how they service their clients. I know that for a fact. I work with hundreds of them. But here's the thing, because of our expertise, we go into, once again, an assumption mode of what our client wants and needs. Because we've been through this before, right? We can look at their, listen to what they're saying, look at their picture, and be like, oh, this is exactly what they need. Ah, but you have to take a time out. You have to find out what they want, right? There's a difference between what somebody wants and what somebody needs. And you know what you're gonna close the deal on? You're gonna close the deal on what they want. So it's about these questions in the conversation are driving your prospect to go ahead and let them reveal what is it that they want. We have to kind of hold back our analysis, right? It's about our prospect and making sure that we understand. So in, just say for an example, let's play this out a little bit, Hector. So with regards to the person that wanted to engage you as an accountant, as an accountant what was it that they really wanted? Like what was important to them? Well, I, at, the, at first they tell you that they want a they want a new accountant, and that's and that that may be a need, that may be a want. I, I don't think there's enough information there. But the first approach or the first question is, "Hey, I need a new accountant that knows this," and that's how they start. So I guess I, I don't have enough information at that point. But I, then you know, after you start asking the questions, if I think of you know the last example I've had, um, it turns out that their last accountant was really good at what they did but uh, they were never available to answer questions. And, 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 and I asked, you know, what, what were some of the questions that you, had pressing, uh, that you had pressing at the time? And I've got to tell you, all the questions were things that as accountants we don't see, we don't see as important. And, and, and possibly, quite, quite probably, the other accountant would, would 
uh, not give it a high priority because the questions don't seem to be highly pertinent to sort of the important things around accounting. But then you start realizing that um, what, what we assume that the client needs, which is just to be answered the important questions, is not necessarily what they want. What they want is just not to worry that they don't know something, I guess. Correct. Um, yeah. Yeah, great job. And right there, the, the, the prospect, they reveal all. All you have to do is listen. That's the big thing that can really turn all this around. When you're listening and honing in on what is it that they want, so from there, now that you know that they want more conversation or to be in the loop on things, now you know how to structure your package or your prices. You're probably going to be checking in with this client maybe a little bit more often than others, maybe twice a month, maybe once a month, whatever it is. But you now know that communication and checking in is really important to them, so you're going to build that into the package to make sure that they're in communication. The other thing is, is if they don't want to miss something, what are they missing now? Maybe you have to build um, a new view on their on their QuickBooks reporting, right? You have to do a custom report for them, create a dashboard. So that's something that you can build in. So just listening to what it is that they want. And you know, like we said, Hector, you knew what this person needed, but ah, what is it that they wanted? They wanted to have more of a, probably a closer communication when it comes to the relationship with their account. That's what they were asking for loud and clear. There's your anchor. So Deborah, um, let me ask you a couple of other questions. Since, you, since you've been doing this for so long and, um, and listening to how uh, people do their sales process and the type of questions they ask, I'm sure you've had a lot of experience about what are those powerful questions that we have in these conversations that drive us uh, wherever we want to go. So the first thing, let me ask you about bad questions, right? Because sometimes we'll make the mistake and ask a bad question. Is there a set of like bad questions or questions that maybe when they're asked wrong or without enough context or without enough rapport can drive the conversation in the wrong direction? Honestly, I don't think there's any bad questions. If you're coming from a place of curiosity and wanting help, I don't think that there's any bad questions. I think if you're not asking questions and you're talking more than your prospect, I think that's bad. <laughs> So it's not about the questions so much. It's about what, who's doing the talking, right? And then who is actually driving the conversation. So that's, that's more of where you want to go ahead and start turning things around. And what about any uh, rapport building techniques, right? So it, we're, we're, this, is, this is maybe going backwards a little bit. Um, you know, I remember from you know, sales training, formal sales training I've had 10, 12 years ago, a while ago, um, a lot of it was about rapport building. And, um, and you know, is there any, anything that's around rapport building specifically? Yeah, great question. And we went ahead and started, started that at the beginning of the conversation when you ask, and you're just coming from a very curious place. Hey, why did you reach out to me? Why are we talking today? And just going a little deeper on that and letting them talk. Um, so that initially is rapport building because if we're just like pushing all of our stuff and this is what we do and this is how great we are and this is, you know, how we can, uh, you know, give you our services, right? That isn't, you know, when it comes from a behavioral standpoint, we've got somebody doing this push method. We do this pull method, right? Of just being curious. That starts building the rapport. The other part of this is, is make sure that you're taking really great notes when somebody is telling you what's going on for them of what it is that they want, not what they need. You know what they need. You want to uncover what they want. And the key thing is, is make sure you're taking some really good notes, whether you're typing them on your computer or you're writing them down, and make sure when you are repeating things back to them, you are using their words and their phraseology, because that from a behavioral standpoint also up-levels the no like trust factor for them to be able to say yes to work, working with you. Because what happens in the subconscious is this person is saying, your prospect, hey, this person gets me. They're using the same language. Wow, I find a lot of commonality with this person. It makes it easier for them to be able to say yes. So that's a great question, Hector. Okay, so to, to unpack that, basically what you're saying is uh, your credentials, your experience, uh, everything you know and everything you've done before is not necessarily what's going to build rapport. It is uh, being inquisitive and just just uh, you know showing genuine interest for what they're for what the needs are. Okay, so that's sort of the first step. Yeah. Um, the second step is um, we want to ask enough questions. Is there is there a particular timeline that you think 
uh, we should uh, shorten this too because we, we could ask questions till Tuesday, right? So yeah. do we want to, does this, does this need to be an hour, two hours? Yeah. What is that first conversation in terms of length, more or less, what should it be? Yeah. So first conversation is anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes. I don't think it needs to be an hour call. Um, if you start getting into an hour call, this is another danger zone that people get into in what we either call a discovery call, a service conversation, or however you want to term it. Um, if it's going any longer than a half an hour, 45 minutes, then you're probably giving a lot of advice on the call. And this is not a call about advice. This is about discovering what your prospect wants at a deep level so that you can go ahead and start crafting the packages and, and services behind what you're going to offer them. Okay, so you're saying that if, it's, if it goes to an hour, this is probably already a consultation that you're giving away for free, it sounds like. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Now let's move on to um, presenting your services, options, and pricing. So I'll ask you the first question, and, and you, can, you can answer uh, multiple ways if you need to, but do we give a price right away? Do we give an offering right away? Or do we, do we wait? Do we sit on it? Do we sleep on it? What's your take in terms of finishing the call with an offering or a price of some sort? So this is the thing where there's two different schools of thought on this. One, some, one school of thought is making sure that you get them on the phone. They call it the one call, one close method. I'm not necessarily that kind of a person. If it happens to happen naturally, that's fine. But a lot of the times, a really smart process is to have that initial call, to build that rapport, and then take a time out at the end. And one of the strategies that we use and most of my clients use is at the end of the conversation to do what's called a test close. And this is how I do it. Um, I go ahead at the end of the conversation and say, hey, listen, you know, I understand a lot of what you told me about your business. Here's what the next step would be. I always offer to put a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement in place. And then I ask for their P&L for the last, for the current year and then the prior year. Because what I want to do is, is I want to see if their story that they told me matches is their numbers because you know the numbers tell its own story and that's where I find the hugest gap is for accounting and bookkeeping professionals they're making offers uh, of packages and, and putting pricing around it without even knowing what they're getting into right a lot of people say oh I wish I saw that P&L beforehand so ask for it because that also is testing what is the commitment of this person for the possibility of working with you right turning over their numbers and being able to to look at that that really helps craft what it is that they probably, how you want to move forward with them. It gives you the complete picture so that you can go in on a level playing field and offer something that can make sense to you and your prospect. Okay, so we're talking about uh, a specific case in which we haven't seen the financial statements yet. Mm -hmm. We're talking to them for the very first time. And you're saying that that gesture of them agreeing to give us profit and loss balance sheet, whatever the financial statements are, that is a way that, they, that you can test the waters to see that they, okay, they, you build some rapport, they, they're starting to build some trust and giving you those numbers is a, it's, it's a gesture of that. And then obviously, I think what you're saying is you review, the, you review the numbers and of course, if you see a big mess, it gives you a good idea more or less whether or not you have to offer some sort of cleanup mode type of service. Um, or if, if, if the numbers jive, I mean, the, the, it looks like the story is being told well, what they told you, what the pain points match the numbers, yes. you have some confirmation in terms of what your engagement looking forward will look like. And then you have a little bit more certainty, which gives you a better idea in terms of how you're going to price it. Correct. Absolutely. And it just creates that level playing field because I hear so many practitioners going into, an enga into engagements and like, oh my gosh, I didn't know this is what I was going to be up against. I should have charged more. I hear it all the time. Now, there are some cases in which um, we have to do sort of two, the two-part engagement, the cleanup engagement, uh, which is where we get them up to speed, get, get the stuff going, and then maybe the ongoing maintenance engagements. That's very typical in our, in our world. Um, those two things are obviously priced uh, separately. Do you believe on, 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 on offering them two separate services for that or bundling them together? So you have to gauge where your prospect is, but this is what I call the one way to get started. 
offer, right? So let's go ahead, let's do a project together, let's do the cleanup. It's gonna reveal a lot of information and we're gonna learn a lot from this process. So why don't we get started with this, see where we are, because then through that process, you may find other things that they may need. So it might make sense to split them up. And I know a lot of people usually do split them up, but re just remember, if a client pays you once, they are 60 to 70% likely to pay you again. So if you just go in with the one offer, right, to just do the cleanup, do a really, really great job, and then go in and present uh, your ongoing services, it can make much more sense to them if you do that in the second offering. Plus, it lowers that, that pressure of commitment from the customer. Yes. Right. Okay. It's so kind yeah, of like it's a great dating, idea. dating before we get married, Correct. right? Because Correct. it's like, oh, hey, you know, it's like, you know, the marriage and the honeymoon, you're presenting them, right? It's like, let's date a little bit. Let's, let's, you know, let's do the project and then we'll see where we go from there. Okay. I love that. Now, in terms of uh, presenting um, your, your, at the end, let's say, for example, we don't need to do a cleanup, but we do need to do a cleanup. Do you believe on, on, on offering one price, multiple prices, multiple options? What's your take on that? Yeah, there is a process I actually teach myself. I'm not going to get into it too much, but a lot of your listeners can look it up. It's called Goldilocks pricing. So remember Goldilocks, the the um, the, the nursery tale um, where they say um, the porridge is too hot, too cold, just right. So there is a strategy. It's called Goldilocks pricing that I tend to teach my clients. Um, but then also, um, that's one way. For, for a strategy, but also there is a strategy within the, the service conversation or the sales conversation, certain questions you can ask where the prospect actually reveals their number. So it reveals the number that they want to pay for your services. So that's exactly what you present. So you just have to, there's two different options there that, that we usually use in, in our practice and with our clients. I heard a, a thought leader in, in the pricing space. His name is Blair Enns. Uh, he has a book called Pricing Creativity. He's kind of a genius in this space. Mm -hmm. I heard him say that uh, th that first conversation is not the best one to give a price, especially yeah. for the larger projects, because you, you kind of want uh, that conversation to sink in a little bit from both sides. You kind of want the customer to go, hmm, I, I, they ask really good questions. I mean, you, it, sometimes when you, when you offer a price right away, you don't give them a chance to just really appreciate what that conversation is all about. Plus, it doesn't give you a chance to really uh, give it some thought. And, um, and I like the way he says. He says that you always come back, um, come back and offer that uh, sort of in person or maybe in a video call. You have to have all the decision makers involved. So it actually matches what you were saying earlier. But you want to offer what's called pricing guidance. You want to say, look, I'm, I'm going to go to my office. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to look through my entire tool set to see what I can offer you. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, a, a, off, a price range of offerings between, and you say two numbers, a thousand and ten thousand, whatever it happens to be. And what you really want is you're, you're not giving them a number, but you're saying what the range of pricing is going to be. And what you really want is if they have an immediate price objection to maybe that lower number, it, you know, maybe you had it in your head what that lower number would be more or less. You want to hear it right there and then before you come back and and put a proposal together. What do you think about that technique? Yeah, and you want to know what? There's no right or wrong when it comes to pricing. Actually, you know, you as the practitioner, you have to do what feels right for you because ultimately your prospect isn't going to buy from you if you're not in the place of, hey, I've got a lot of confidence in what I'm, what I'm offering. So if you're using a pricing strategy that you don't connect with or that you're uncomfortable with, don't use it. There's so many different strategies you can use out there, and we're just sharing just a couple of them. So, yeah, you have to be comfortable with it because you have to sell yourself before you sell your client, don't forget. so. Of course. Well, thank you, Deborah. That was great. Um, what are some ways that folks can uh, learn more about you and what you do? Yeah, so thanks for that. You want to know what? We've got something that might be helpful for your, for your listeners, um, and it's called, I have it right here, it's called Six Crucial Questions to Double Your Value with One Conversation. And it is six questions that you can ask on your next service call um, that will make all the difference in the world. So if uh, your listeners want to access that, they can go to my website. It's DebraAngeletta.com. Uh, Angeletta is two L's and two T's. Dot com. Go to the contact page and just in the little info section, put in your name, your email address, and in the notes, just put sales conversations and we'll get that out to you. 
Awesome, Deborah. Any last uh, tips? If you have one last gold tip, gold piece of nugget that you can give to folks just trying to, uh, you know, just close more deals, get better clients, uh, improve their branding, whatever. Yeah. One thing, one big game changer, listen more. There's two ears. We have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen to what your prospects are telling you. They will reveal all. So then it's no guessing of what you offer in the end to your prospect. That's perfect. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks, Hector. Bye-bye.